Is there any other game that does world building in the same way that League of Legends does? How rare is it to find a story so strong, characters so compelling, that they transcend the genre of video games and stand alone in TV series, comics, and the written word? Can you think of a game that sets the standard for character design in the current MOBA climate while simultaneously having some of the most outdated, inconsistent, and unappealing visuals in any relevant game from 2023? League's transition from generic fantasy MOBA to genre-defining multimedia experience has fascinated me for years now. As someone who is constantly revisiting his own artwork, looking to improve in accordance with what I've learned over the years, the concept of updating old character designs so that they better represent your current standards sparks a fire within me. And nothing burns me up more than seeing old champions get left behind while the rest of the game blazes ahead into the future. We're back, everyone. Welcome to Subjectively. My name is Jack, and in case you haven't deduced it yet, today's video will be about everybody's favorite flamer, Brand. Like so many old champion designs from League of Legends, you may assume that Brand is a minor enemy from any number of outdated fantasy games. He could be one of Ares' soldiers from the end of God of War. He'd fit in well among the hordes of demonic foes that you fight off in waves in any given Diablo game. But despite how ineffectual his character design may be at conveying his true power, Brand is actually one of the greatest threats to all of Runeterra, on par with such final bosses as Mordekaiser, Swain, and Lissandra. Our goal in this video is to dissect the character of Brand, who he was, what he is, and what role he plays. Then we're going to break him apart, toss out the bits we don't like, and use what works to rebuild the character as something that not only fits in with the rest of League of Legends, but also does justice to the tragedy and triumph of his story. Before we do any of that though, I want to give a massive thank you to our Subjectively Patreon supporters, and a very special thanks to our super subjectivist, Rose. We love what we do here at Subjectively, and we love that we can do it for a living. You guys make that possible. If you'd like to help us continue to keep this channel going strong, consider becoming a supporter on Patreon. We have awesome monthly rewards like prints, stickers, and even in-depth character design lessons. Any amount helps, and we really appreciate it. Thanks again to all of our fans and supporters, and now, let's get back to the video. Okay, who is Brand? Well, from a game design perspective, Brand is a burst mage support champion that was added to League of Legends about 12 years ago. His kit involves setting people on fire, setting more people on fire, and occasionally stunning or slowing people who are on fire. He's a somewhat underutilized champion, hovering around a 5% pick rate at all skill levels. This may be because he's a bit undertuned, or maybe it's just that he's not all that exciting to play. Regardless, our focus today won't be on the gameplay of Brand. We don't have any plans to change the way he plays, his stats, or the effects of his abilities. Instead, we're going to be making changes to the visuals of the character so that they better suit the role that he plays in the world of Runeterra. For all intents and purposes, we're giving Brand an ASU, or an Art and Sustainability update. Some other examples of ASUs in League of Legends include Ari and Caitlyn, soon to be followed by Teemo and Lee Sin. These changes are given to help keep the entire game feel more consistent throughout the roster of playable champions. Some older characters, like Galio or Swain, needed head-to-toe redesigns that changed everything from their visuals to their kit and even their stories. In this case, we don't feel like Brand really needs an entire overhaul. His kit is fine, if not a little unexciting, and his story is actually really compelling. What needs to be changed most is the visuals of the character. Let's talk about Brand's story for a moment, because it's very important to understand who Brand is in order to successfully redesign him. Though most players know him as the guy on fire, Brand used to be a normal human. Well, almost normal. He was born Keegan Road, son of a reaver and raised by his shaman mother. He grew up in the unforgiving wastelands of the Freljord, surrounded at all times by fear and hatred. Even his own mother resented him, as his fiery temper reminded her of his father. Without any explicit details, we can assume that Keegan's dad was not a great guy. The rest of his village held his lineage against him too, dubbing Keegan the Reaver Bastard and shunning both him and his mother from the safety of the settlement. Despite all this, Keegan's mother worked hard to help the people of Rigan's Reach, using her inborn magical abilities to heal the sick and tend to the wounded. 
When the inhospitable conditions that she lived in finally claimed her life at an early age, however, no one in the village showed any remorse. Keegan was forced to spread his mother's ashes alone, and sought revenge against the chieftain of Rigan's Reach for what he believed to be the cause of his mother's death. Blinded by rage and, somewhat unintentionally, Keegan set fire to the entire village, killing the chieftain and several innocents. He even ended up killing the only person he ever knew that showed him any kind of affection, as well as her husband and young child. Needless to say, he didn't feel great about this. He left Rigan's Reach in ruins, unsure of where he was going or what he was looking for. After weeks of wandering the Freljord alone, he condemned himself to a slow, cold death. And it may have found him, if not for the intervention of a wandering mage called Rise. Rise found the young man and nursed him back to health, and before long, he learned that Keegan Road was more than just a simple barbarian. Rise taught Keegan how to master his arcane abilities, slowly unraveling the mysteries of magic to him. Though he was eager to learn, Keegan had a hard time comprehending the most important rule of magic. You can't control it, only guide it. His pupil showed potential, but Rise grew concerned about Keegan's interest in his quest to relocate and secure the world runes that were scattered all across Runeterra. The world runes are powerful magical artifacts that, in a time before Keegan Road, brought about mass destruction on an apocalyptic scale. In the wrong hands, these runes could be used to raise cities, level mountains, or dry out the sea. Rise knew that they must be hidden away, somewhere no one could ever find them again, but he also knew that the temptation of power was far too great for most to resist. Under circumstances not yet fully revealed to us by the official writing team, Keegan Road became another victim of this temptation. He succumbed to the allure of one of the world runes, absorbing the power of the stone and transforming him from a young mage into a horrific monstrosity of fire and magic. Rise and Brand spent some time racing each other to more world runes, Rise hoping to hide them away, and Brand seeking their power to further his own strength. Eventually, Rise was able to trap Brand beneath the sands of Shirima, where, as far as we know, he still rests today. Keegan wanted nothing but acceptance, to be loved unconditionally, but when no such love could be found, he resorted to violence, earning the respect he felt he deserved through fear. He's letting out all of the rage that's been building up inside him for years. That rage, combined with his own inborn magical ability and the power of the world rune, now burns hotter than the sun. But of course, no one would blame you if you didn't get any of that from the way his character looks and behaves in the game now. Nothing about his visuals implies any sort of importance or significance, there doesn't appear to be any connection to the world runes or Rise, and it's hard to tell if he was ever even a human, or if this dude just popped out of a volcano one day with a pair of ripped cargo pants and way too many belts. Let's take a look at the brand we have now, and try to figure out which parts of this design should stay, and which bits we can either improve on or toss completely. I like the surface texture of the body, something in between obsidian and charred wood. It reads like there was once something there that has been reduced by the heat of Bran's own fire down to nothing but blackened remains. The texture can stay, but the anatomy needs to change. Bran having such a slender yet muscular build makes it look like he's just a burned corpse, not the physical manifestation of the power of the world runes. There is something to be said about him looking like the desecrated remains of the man he once was, but the original designers leaned too heavily into that aesthetic, and the end result is a character that looks a lot less powerful than he actually is. He looks like the, uh, the charred corpse model from the Half-Life series. Keegan Road was the kind of person who overcompensated for his insecurities by acting tough, looking mean, and fighting back. The runestone enhanced these aspects of his personality, and while much of his humanity has been burned away, the power it granted him would, in my opinion, only make him look more like a big tough bully. The pants definitely need to go. What are these things? Seriously, what character in a fantasy world like League of Legends would wear what I interpret as khaki shorts with frayed cuffs? And what's with the belts? Is he afraid that his pants might fall off his emaciated body if he doesn't secure them with at least three belts on each leg? Interestingly, he's not wearing a belt around his waist, which is where most people put their belts when they're worried their pants may fall down. The fact that Brand is wearing clothes at all is a little ridiculous to me. We can assume, just by looking at this character, that the surface temperature of his skin is hot enough to burn through regular clothing. It's even implied that the bottom parts of his pants 
burned away. It tells a viewer that while he's powerful enough to burn down a forest in the blink of an eye, he is somehow incapable of obliterating a pair of pants. I guess it's like the Hulk, where they are implying that he's tearing through all of his clothes, but they can't have Bruce just slinging massive green sausage in every panel. Either way, if we want to censor Bran's nether regions, I think we can figure out something that's a little bit more imposing than a pair of cutoffs and six belts. Bran also has like, I don't know, a swirl? carved into the side of his head? This might be the original designers trying to imply some connection to the world runes, but more likely it was just a quick and easy way to fill up some negative space in a way that was consistent with a lot of other League characters at the time. I actually like the idea here, having the runes that are a source of his power carved into his body in certain places. It would be a good way to break up some of the big open negative space that, in this design, are just blank. We just need a way to make sure that these markings are a little bit more considered than just a swirl on either side of his head. And honestly, that's kind of it. There's not much more to dissect here. Brand is really just a dude on fire, and there's not much to interpret or analyze about his visuals. In fact, him being on fire is probably the aspect of his identity that I'll try to preserve the most. Fire, as a metaphorical theme, really fits in with Brand's backstory and personality. Plus, I mean, come on. Imagine if I just decided that Brand wasn't gonna be the fire guy anymore. There would be riots. My first few sketches were just intended to help me loosen up a little bit. I don't do this as often as I should when designing characters, but a few really gestural, non-specific sketches can help you get loose ideas down onto paper. Brand is all about power, about energy and movement. This style of sketching may be inconsistent with the finished products we associate with League of Legends, but it does help me get a better understanding of what new elements we can bring into Brand's design to spice things up a little bit. Of these rough sketches, the idea that I was most drawn to included the more demonic-looking face and the face that was half-burned, half-ignited. It made Brand feel like two characters in one body. Half of the character was what was left of Keegan Road, not very much, and the rest was the burning, raging embodiment of power and vengeance that became Brand. I stayed loose in my second set of sketches, but this time trying to do more full-body designs. It was here that I experimented with just how different I wanted to make Brand. Would he remain mostly humanoid, as he is now, or was I going to depart from everything that we know about Brand and create something that felt completely new? The important thing to remember at this stage of the development process is that nothing has to be set in stone. You can experiment with many different kinds of ideas before settling on something you really like. It may not even be one of the designs you drew, it could be a combination of specific elements that you liked from each design all mushed together. In this case, I like how pained the first design looked, like the power this character wielded was almost a burden to him. Of course, it still looked very frail and vulnerable, like if you poured water on him he would shrivel up and fall over. The third design I did, on the other hand, looked powerful. But it was too much of a departure from the source material, more demonic than I wanted Bran to look, plus it felt a little too much like Zerath. This actually meant that I was going in the right direction. Zareth's story is actually pretty similar to Bran's, and I think his design is pretty good. But because I didn't want our brand ASU to turn into Galarian Zarath, I decided instead to take the parts from the third design and the first design that I liked and combine them. That hunched over, pained posture was not only an element of Bran's personality that I thought we could include in the visuals of the design, but it's also reminiscent of Bran's current in-game look. I wanted to keep that, but I also wanted to use the shattered musculature that I had in the third sketch. I kept asking myself, should Brand look frail and emaciated as if the power granted to him by the rune is actively destroying him, or should his power level be reflected in his build? Though I like the idea of subverting the typical visuals associated with strength and power, I thought that making him too skinny or decrepit may contradict just how powerful he really is. There are certainly ways to convey power without making your character a giant buff man. But in the case of Brand, a Freljordian son of a reaver who uses power to make himself feel tougher, it made the most sense to me to have his visuals reflect the man he believes himself to be. After all, the world rune gave him what he wanted, the power to make people fear him, and by extension, respect him. It may come at the cost of his humanity, but at the end of the day, he is much more powerful as Brand than he was as Keegan Road. 
Furthermore, if you took a lineup of the most powerful antagonistic forces in League of Legends, Mordekaiser, Swain, Belveth, and Lissandra, for example, and put Brand in that same lineup, the average League of Legends player wouldn't assume that he's anywhere near as dangerous as the rest of them. I wanted to make Brand feel like he's as much as a threat to Runeterra as any of these final bosses. These two sketches were getting close to what I wanted for Brand. Having a hollow cavity in his chest, filled by the rune, was a great way to convey that raw power had replaced much of what made him human. He has no heart, no soul, no organs or blood. He's a creature of rage and destruction. However, he still didn't look important enough. Something about this design still read as like a minor boss, not so much main bad guy. Finally, I realized that as much as I didn't want to, I had to cover up his groin. I liked the idea of Brand losing so much of his humanity that he didn't even wear clothes anymore, but the tattered loincloth made the design look a lot more significant to the story of League of Legends than the fully naked one. Plus, it gave me an opportunity to allude to his Freljordian roots. Let's talk about that for a moment. Brand is not really Keegan Road, he's not Freljordian. Visually, I don't think there's any reason to make him look connected to characters like Sezwani or Braum or Ash. However, if I was going to include some sort of clothing to break up his nether regions, I might as well include some subtle Freljordian patterings. I imagine that these remnants of cloth and armor were what Keegan was wearing when he transformed into Brand. In this next sketch, I also reduced the size of the actual runestone that Brand had impaled into his chest. As much as I like the visual of a giant sharp stone sticking through his entire body, the canonical appearance of the runestones is much, much smaller. It left more space in the hollow pit that was once Keegan's ribcage. Also worked more into the face, bringing in some ideas from my first sketches. The sort of, like, Phantom of the Opera look that I had in that initial sketch was a great way to convey the last fragments of Bran's humanity clinging to the monster that he's become. I imagine that Keegan's face hardened into this mask, while most of the rest of him burned away. Then the question became, what do I do under the mask? Because of cultural taboos in China, skull and generally skeletal imagery is avoided in modern League of Legends artwork. League is an internationally played game, after all. Fortunately, I don't work for Riot Games, and I don't have to adhere to those same restrictions. However, after I did this drawing, I had a realization. Generic skulls are kind of boring. I mostly wanted to make the other half of Brand's face skull-like to illustrate how what we see is what's left after the rest of Keegan burned away. But using just a simple skull made it look... <laughs> I don't know, it just made it look silly. I tried to shake it up a bit, use some more stylized features to keep the face from looking so generic. However, making the fiery half of the face too intricate detracted from the mask, which I wanted to be the focal point of the head. I did one final draft, this time focusing on refining the appearance of the mask and the head underneath so that the character emanated more final boss energy. I gave the mask more adornments to make it seem crown-shaped. There are certain visuals that an audience associates with power, and as silly as it sounds, more elaborate headgear is one of them. Honestly, I think the head and the face could probably do with a little bit more exploration. I was happy with what I had, but I think if I gave myself another month, I could make something even more exciting. Either way, I was happy with the sketch, and I decided that this would be the final draft, at least for this video. When it came to adding colors, I stayed pretty consistent with what we already know as Brand's palette. Lots of reds, yellows, and oranges, as well as browns, blacks, and blues for the solid parts of the body. I love painting fire. It's so much fun to capture the energy and movement of such an immaterial subject matter. You can stylize it in ways that may not look realistic, but certainly read as fire. I also love all the subtle shifts in hue that you can find in fire and lava and ashes. Brand, obviously, was a great opportunity to indulge in these rendering styles. The last thing I did was a top-down illustration of the ASU concept as a representation of what the character might look like as a 3D model in the actual game of League of Legends. I haven't really done this before in any of our other League of Legends redesigned videos, but I think it's a good way to double-check that your final product looks like it would really mesh well with the official game. It also gave me an opportunity to do a turnaround for the character. Not really necessary for a project like this, but it did help make the whole thing feel a bit more three-dimensional. No pun intended. Like I said, there are still a few more things that I think I could change or add to this design, but for now, I'm very happy with the way it looks. If you have any thoughts or feedbacks in regards to further changes that we could make to our brand design, please leave those ideas down in the comments. The last part of these videos is always designated to the splash art. I did a rough black and white thumbnail to map out the composition, and then Claire did the rest. 
Claire's been spending a lot of time studying official League of Legends splash art, and with each new character redesign video, she gets better and better at replicating that style. This might be her best splash art yet, and we can't wait to show you. While the time-lapse footage of Claire's painting process plays, I'll be narrating a story that I wrote to help fill in the gaps of Bran's lore. There may be a few inconsistencies with the official canon, and you'll have to excuse my amateur voice acting. But I, I enjoy writing a narrative to accompany each of these redesigns. After all, it's the stories that create the characters, and I believe that any strong character design needs a strong story to complete it. So sit back, relax, and enjoy Claire's painting process while I read the newest chapter in Bran's story, A Spark to a Flame. A flash of yellow, a spark of blue. Arcane lights shone through the mist, followed by a rhythmic series of cracks and pops. The ancient village that once lay desolate on the edge of the Freljordian border now surged with supernatural energy. Within the hazy fog, several figures could be distinguished, revealed only by the brief flashes of light that emanated from the two men in the center of the group. The taller of the two, well-built and full of wrathful energy, released blasts of fiery energy from his fingertips. The other man, shorter and scrawnier by comparison, cast a series of mesmerizing spells with ease, bathing the area around them in eerie blue light. Surrounding the two men were about a dozen undead villagers, hobbling towards their quarry with unwavering resolve. So, this is it, huh? My final test. The taller man scoffed as he produced a sizable mass of yellow energy and launched it at one of the undead. The spell hit its mark, sending the zombie careening backwards and leaving a smoldering hole through its chest. <laughs> Not much of a challenge. The other man said nothing. The blue light from his spells illuminated his hardened countenance. His eyes were focused, his lips pursed. Crack! The sound of the taller mage's spells echoed throughout the ruins of the village. He was cloaking his fists in flames now, laying waste to his foes with the unbridled fury of a barbarian. At last, when there was only one undead left standing, the man unleashed a final, devastating spell. Using both his hands, he sent forth a jet of searing flames that crackled with magical energy. The zombie was reduced to ashes, its vanquisher standing triumphantly over its remains. Keegan Rode turned to face his master, an uncharacteristic grin plastered over his scarred face. Well, how did I do? Keegan asked enthusiastically. His master, Rise, stared at the young man intensely. His expression read as something in between concern and surprise, and Keegan's mood changed in an instant. It's not enough, is it? The young man said, the smile vanishing from his face. Keegan turned away from Rise and clutched at his tangled hair. It's never enough, he shouted, kicking the piles of ashes at his feet. Keegan started pacing furiously, cursing and spitting at the ground. Rise watched him patiently. The young man had indeed come far in the short time since they had met. When Rise had found Keegan, he was on death's door, barely able to stand. His innate magical abilities had yet to be harnessed, and he was incapable of generating so much as a spark in his hands. It was impressive just how much Keegan had improved, and Rise felt a swelling sense of pride stir somewhere in his chest. And yet, there was something that concerned Rise about the way his pupil treated magic. How he forced the arcane energy of the world to do his bidding. How his smoldering rage fueled his spells. Rise had hoped that, at this point, he could feel safe in trusting Keegan with the truth about why they had come here. But he wasn't ready yet. Keegan had come to a stop at one of the cottages that lay in ruins within the deserted town. He stared in through the moldering window frame, his eyes resting on a crib that laid in pieces therein. His face flickered with emotion, before hardening back into a scowl. He spun around to face Rise. I have spent the last year clinging to your every word, Keegan shouted, following you on foot for months on end as you drag me from one death trap to another. I have stayed up with you late into the night, heeding your ceaseless lectures and humoring your inscrutable parables. 
I completed your little assignments, meditated on your lessons, and I have improved. Am I not deserving of even a grain of praise from you? Rise continued to stare at Keegan, his face slowly softening from shock to despondency. There, there it is, Keegan growled, pointing at the man before him. That look of disappointment, I know it well. Keegan, I'm not disappointed. Don't lie to me, Keegan shouted, and his voice echoed throughout the village. I am not as stupid as you think I am, master. He said this last word in a poisonously condescending tone. Don't you think I recognize that look? I have seen it a thousand times before, on your face, on the faces of those at Rigan's Reach, and of course on the face of my... Keegan stopped abruptly, as if suddenly aware of how loudly he was speaking. He closed his mouth and looked down at the ground, running his fingers through his hair. Rise sighed. Fine. I shouldn't insult you with misleading statements, Keegan. You deserve that much. You're right. I am disappointed. Keegan opened his mouth to interrupt, but Rise raised a finger. Not for the reason you think, he continued. Keegan, you have improved your skills far more quickly than any other mage I've known. This statement caught Keegan off guard. His expression changed again, now to that of confusion, or perhaps frustration. But it is still not enough, Keegan asked again, though he said it more like a statement than a question. Rise shook his head. In a way, Keegan... You can cast spells and conquer foes, but being a good mage isn't about wielding your power like a weapon. You still don't understand the very first thing I taught you. Magic cannot be controlled, only guided. Until you truly comprehend what that means, you will still have more to learn. Keegan strode back and forth, processing his master's words. He was grumbling to himself. A slew of carefully selected profanity could be distinguished amongst the inaudible murmurs. So, that's it then, Keegan said at last, turning to face Rise once again. I failed my final test. Rise smiled weakly. There will always be another chance to prove yourself, Keegan. There will never be a final test. The mage turned away from his pupil, staring down the obstructed cobblestone path towards a great, crumbling structure in the distance. Wait here, Rise said back at Keegan, who furrowed his brow. Wait here, Keegan repeated. Yes, there's something I must attend to alone before we move on. Please, remain on watch in the village until I return. Keegan scoffed. You didn't bring me here to test me, did you? This is all about your secret little mission. The one you refused to share with me. Rise grimaced. Perhaps he did underestimate the boy's intelligence from time to time. You are not ready to face what awaits us within that hall. Rise shot back at Keegan. I had hoped by now things would be different, but as I said before, you still have far too much yet to learn. Without warning, a yellow light flew past Ryze's face. The projectile exploded against the ruins of a building behind him, and the heat from the blast stung the mage's ear. Keegan stood in a combat stance, his left fist glowing with magical energy. Keegan, Ryze said in a subdued yet threatening tone, don't do this, not now. Keegan chuckled dryly. <laughs> you think you can command me like some mongrel pup? I will not be made to sit back and wait again and again as you find glory in solitude. Rise eyed his pupil and sighed. I'm sorry, Keegan. One day, I promise, I will explain all of this to you. But for now, another blast fired towards Rise, this one hitting him square in the chest. He stumbled backwards, clutching the charred mark the spell left. I'm not ready, am I? Keegan spat. Still have more to learn. I will prove how capable I am, master. I will earn your respect if I have to beat it out of you. The young man pulled his fist back, charging up another spell. Quicker than Keegan could react, Ryze's hands weaved through the air, producing a swirl of blue tendrils. A glowing circle appeared directly below Keegan's feet, and the young man froze. His feet were rooted to the ground, and nothing he could do would free them. Rise's binding spell had done its job. Without saying a word, Rise turned away from his pupil and walked up the road towards the ruinous hall. Master! Keegan shouted, still struggling to free himself from the binding spell. Curse you, you foolish old mage! I will not be treated this way! 
Keegan's words faded as Rise continued along the cobblestone path. He didn't look back. He couldn't. Maybe Keegan would forgive him. Maybe he would not. Right now, none of that mattered. Rise rubbed his eyes. Though neither man would ever admit it, at that moment, Ulf shed a tear. The once grand doors of the castle were now rotted and decayed. Rise remembered the time when four armed men were required to open these colossal gates. Now he needed only to push aside a chunk of the moldered wood to force himself through the narrow opening. Inside, the remains of a cavernous hall sprawled out before Rise. Massive oak pillars extended from the floor up to what was once a ceiling, now a gaping hole through which dappled moonlight was shining. Rise took a deep breath and continued forward. His footsteps echoed throughout the desolate chamber. The grandiose carpet that once led from the entrance to the throne in the middle of the court now was rotted away to almost nothing, its tattered remnants clinging to the cobblestone floor. Though the image of Volendreg's hall in its glory was still vivid in his mind, Rise could hardly believe that this crumbling ruin was once the proudest keep in all of the Freljord. It wasn't the decaying doors or the caved-in ceiling that made Rise uncomfortable, however. It was the bodies. Dozens, maybe hundreds of skeletal human remains littered what was left of Volendreg's hall. Heaped in piles, radiating outward from the center of the room, it was as if some great explosion originating from the throne had, in an instant, laid waste to an entire court of royal subjects. But there were more, newer bodies clad in armor from distant lands, some of which looked far less decayed than others. This was the choice I made, the lives of a few to preserve the lives of many. Rise had tried again and again to find the wisdom in these words, to somehow justify the atrocities that were laid out before him. Still, and stronger now than it had felt in years, the stabbing pain of guilt tore through his heart. And so you return. A rasping, echoey voice emanated from somewhere within the ruins. Rise, guardian of the ruins, protector of Valoran, and the unsung hero of mankind. The throne in the center of the room was now bathed in moonlight and illuminated clearly. From behind it, a withered hand emerged. It clung to the side of the rotting throne, and slowly an equally emaciated-looking man inched his way into the light. His many robes and pelts hung loosely from his skeletal frame. One could assume from the size of these garments that at some point in this man's life, he was a great deal larger. Heavy iron pauldrons sat on his shoulders, rusted and scarred. A massive belt that could have been tied around his waist ten times swung from his hips like some long-dead serpent. Atop his head, with its blackened skin stretched so tightly around his skull that it appeared as if he had none at all, set a jagged crown. He reached for a broken blade that laid across his throne. In his other hand, he clasped what appeared to be a sharpened piece of stone. The stone glowed with an eerie yellow light. Volendreg, Rise addressed the lich as he settled in his throne, one hand now holding what was left of the sword, the other still clutching the glowing stone. Volendreg let out a haunting cackle. So chilling was his laugh that Rise could not help but suppress a shiver. I have not been called that name in many a winter, the Withered King retorted. The Forsaken Father, the Lich of Owendale, I now accept these as my mantle. My true name has been lost to time. The man you once were was lost as well. True, very true, Volendreg responded enthusiastically. That aged old husk I once called my body has been shed, and from it rises a more powerful me. From where I'm standing, it looks more like the husk is all that remains. Volendreg grinded his black teeth menacingly. As if this was not your plan all along. He stood up abruptly, his many tassels and loose armor pieces clanging against each other. To leave me with this stone, this cursing wretched stone, so that it might drain me of my strength, till I'm no longer a threat to you. With this, Volendreg threw back his many heavy cloaks to reveal his bare chest. His ribcage was an empty pit, a gaping maw of darkness through which no viscera could be seen. He held the stone in his hand high above his head. Your plan, my friend, has backfired. Volendreg plunged the stone into the hole in his chest. 
He doubled over, grunting and retching with pain. Even still, the light from the stone shone brighter and brighter. It pierced through the many layers of fur and cloth that enshrouded the old man until, with a single burst of energy, the trappings were flung from his body. The shockwave sent Rise sliding backwards as well, and he shielded his eyes from the yellow light radiating from Volendreg. In the misty village below Volendreg's hall, Keegan sat with his knees pulled up to his chest. His head was buried in his thick arms, and his shoulders sagged. Suddenly, the stillness of the night was shattered by a cacophonous boom. Keegan looked up at the great structures into which Rise had disappeared. A pillar of yellow light was now reaching from the ruins up into the sky, and waves of heat pulsed over the village. The blue ring beneath Keegan's feet flickered, and as the light died down from within the hall, the binding spell faded. Keegan slowly rose to his feet. He stared with malice at the ruins, imagining the epic battle that was surely transpiring therein. You are not ready. You have far more to learn. Ryze's words echoed in Keegan's head, and he clenched his fists. Not ready, Keegan growled to himself. We'll see about that. By the time Keegan had reached the shattered oak doors that once stood tall over the entrance to the hall, the fighting within seemed to have ceased. Clouds of dust and smoke obscured his vision as Keegan pressed through the entranceway into the crumbling ruin. He coughed, shielding his face from the heat of the fire that burned at the center of the hall. The entire chamber rumbled threateningly, and bits of rubble fell from the walls. The old wood that supported what was left of Volendreg's hall was splintering, and the crackling fire licked at the aged pillars. Keegan approached Volendreg's throne slowly, and stared up at the great horror that stood before him. A man. No, not a man. A monster stood over the throne. Taller than any human Keegan had ever seen, glowing with an arcane golden light, its body was comprised of luminescent muscle and armor, as if some powerful magic had formed its own physical avatar. Within the translucent, radiant body, Keegan could make out the silhouette of a withered skeleton, and glowing from within its black ribs was a stone, carved with a single rune. The monster stood with a massive sword in one hand, and from the other, gripped tightly by his throat, dangled rise. Keegan's master was battered and bruised. His usual air of stoicism and composure was gone, and for the first time, Keegan saw Rise struggle. The mage was clawing desperately at the air in front of him. It looked as though he was reaching towards his captor's chest, towards the stone that rested within his ribs. Keegan ducked behind a pile of rubble and watched in anticipation. A thundering laugh resonated throughout the crumbling hall. The force of it was enough to dislodge more rubble from the walls. You thought yourself infallible, mage, the monster jeered at the tiny man in his grip. Surely your plan could never fail. Leave the room with me, foolish old Volendreg. He would keep it safe, you thought. Consumed by its power, he would hide himself away, killing all who would try to take it from him. Now he pulled Rise closer to his menacing visage. Gasping for air, Rise continued to reach for the runestone in Volendreg's chest. The monster chuckled. Look at you, you reek of hypocrisy. The runes are too dangerous for any one man. They must be hidden away, lest all of Runeterra be destroyed. I knew this to be a lie from the very beginning. You are no different than I, or Tyrus, or any other to succumb to the power of the runes. Even now, you grope desperately for the power I wield. Cursing yourself for your ever-compounding failures. Keegan gritted his teeth. His master was in danger. This was the moment he was waiting for to prove himself worthy. But the words of this monster struck a chord within Keegan, and every doubt and suspicion he ever had about Rise flooded back into his mind. And that stone, the rune, as he had heard it called. Rise wanted it. The monster wanted it. Could this be why his master brought them here? He gripped the rubble behind which he was hidden, and continued to watch intently. Volendreg tightened his grip around Ryza's throat, and pulled him so close to his face that the mage's nose almost touched his. You were right about one thing, though. Volendreg growled quietly. I will kill 
anyone who tries to take this power from me. With this, a great monster slammed rise into the stone floor with such force that the entire hall shook. Splintered beams of wood fell from the ceiling in a cascade of dust and debris. Keegan had to roll out of the way to avoid being crushed. As he righted himself, he locked eyes with the monster, who hissed. Who do we have here? Rise struggled to lift himself from the cracked stone on which he lay. He only just managed to raise his head enough to make eye contact with his pupil. Keegan, he wheezed. Run. Another roaring laugh from Volendrag. Is this another of your disciples, Rise? One more imbecile to play as your pawn. The monster took a few earth-shaking steps toward Keegan and kneeled down towards the young man until they were just an arm's length apart. I almost pity him. This last statement sparked a fire within Keegan's soul. Everything around him melted away. The world turned red and his fists became white-hot stars. He could see nothing, hear nothing. The only thing he was aware of was the runestone before him. Without even knowing what he was doing, his hand shot forward towards the monster's chest, and he felt his fingers close around the stone. It was hot, searing his flesh like an iron poker from the coals. He didn't care. Keegan wrenched the stone from its prison within Volendrag's chest. The monster let out an ear-splitting roar. As the room was torn from his body, the yellow light that enveloped him disappeared. A shockwave, originating from Volendrag, sent Keegan flying backwards, extinguishing the fires throughout the throne room and clearing the hall of smoke. Keegan tumbled across the floor, all the while gripping the runestone in his hand. His entire left arm was burning now, and as he righted himself, he was horrified to see that it was glowing from his hand up to his forearm. The world around him was still quiet, and yet there were voices, whispers that flowed in and out of Keegan's consciousness singing in unknown tongues. He understood. They were speaking to him. Please. A hoarse whisper came from the decrepit body of the fallen Volendreg. Please. The rune. I need it. I, I need it. The lich of Uendale dragged his charred skeletal body across the floor towards Keegan. He gripped the young man's ankles and stared up into his eyes. His gaze was met by a merciless stare, by eyes the old man recognized all too well. I... He started to speak again, but with one swift movement, Keegan's boot went straight through Volendreg's skull. It was silent now, but for the sounds of a few small bits of debris colliding against the rubble and the arcane crackling of Keegan's left arm. Keegan lifted the rune in his hand up to his face and examined it closely. A seed to a tree, a spark to a flame, he murmured to himself. Master, when I asked you if there was a source to all the magic in this world, what did you tell me? Rise staggered to his feet now, clutching at his side and coughing violently. Keegan, now is not the time. He managed to speak through the fits of coughs and wheezes. We must... What did you tell me? Keegan repeated, and he was shouting now. I... I told you. I told you that... Rise couldn't finish his sentence. Every word pained him. He doubled over again, steadying himself against the rubble. You told me that I was not ready to know. Keegan answered his own question. You dismissed my curiosity and denied me knowledge so that you could hoard it for yourself. No, Keegan, I... Enough of your lies! Enough of your deflections! This is it, is it not? The source of the magic that flows through my veins. The source of all magic in this world. I can feel it. I can hear it. And you... Keegan took a step towards Rise. You would have all that power for yourself! Rise shook his head slowly and looked up towards his student. This was not the man he found dying in the snow all those months ago. This was not the boy from Rigan's Reach, the reaver bastard who lived in isolation, surrounded by hatred and longing for love. This was a monster. A monster Rise knew. 
a monster born of paranoia, of greed and fear. It hungered for something to silence the insecurities that racked its tiny mind, a weapon that would instill the same terror it felt into the hearts of all of those who would dare make it feel small. Rise extended a shaking hand. Keegan, I was wrong to lie to you. I was wrong to keep you in the dark. I never meant to hurt you, you just weren't- Don't say it. Keegan spoke in a voice that was not his own. Don't you dare speak those words. Never again. I am ready, Rise. I am stronger than you would ever admit. I see you now for who you really are. You were never my teacher, never my master. Just a man who was afraid that if I knew the truth, I could take from you that which you wanted most. Keegan admired the stone clutched in his fist. His eyes moved from his hand up his arm. The glow extended past his shoulder, now creeping up his neck towards his face. The words in his head were no longer whispers. The songs the runes sang were a chorus beating in time with his heart. They longed to be one. You are afraid, Rise, Keegan said again, not bothering to look at the mage who was slowly writing himself. Summoning every last ounce of will in his being, Rise began to charge up a powerful spell. It had to be done. Keegan's eyes darted from the stone to his master. Are you going to kill me, Rise? Keegan said, chuckling slightly. Do it then. Erase all doubt from my mind. Let this be your final test. Rise hesitated, and the glow from his hands dimmed slightly. Keegan clicked his tongue. You're not ready. The temperature in that cold, dark hall shifted as if the sun had suddenly fallen from the sky. Keegan's arm glowed so brightly that Rise could only barely see his pupil drive the jagged runestone into his chest. Another shockwave shook the hall, this one so hot that Rise felt his skin singe. Shimmering ruins carved themselves into the air around Keegan. Rise heard their voices too now. They were whispering a discordant song like that of an errant choir. The wind picked up, a hot, dry wind that swirled the dust and debris up from the floor. The bones of Volendreg's many victims were lifted from their resting places and were slowly charred black by the heat. Rise closed his eyes. There was nothing more he could do. Even now you grope desperately for the power I wield, cursing yourself for your ever-compounding failures. Volendreg's words echoed mockingly inside Rise's head. He focused all of his power into one last spell. His body shone blue, and in an instant, he was gone. Rise reappeared on a mountaintop overlooking the village. He landed on all fours, gasping for breath and spitting blood into the snow. He brought himself shakily to his feet and stared in horror at what remained of the tiny village. Molten rock flowed from Volendreg's hall and down onto the tiny huts and hovels. Flames spread from the dead foliage out into the forest that surrounded the village. Within a matter of minutes, the entire valley was consumed by fire. At the epicenter of the destruction rested a great obsidian ore. Glowing red runes were carved into its cracked shell, and they pulsed like veins in some horrific stone heart. The cracks spread from one rune to another, and yellow light shone from within. With a devastating boom, the orb shattered. From within its molten core, a man slowly emerged. No, not a man. A monster. Keegan Road was dead. Dead at the hands of Rise and his short-sightedness. Dead, just like Volendreg or Tyrus. All his potential, all his promise burned away in the blink of an eye, replaced by a charred abomination of fire and rage. And that's it. Our redesign of brand is complete. What do you guys think? 
If you ask me, this is one of our strongest League of Legends redesigns to this date. Everything from the splash art to the design to the story that I wrote, I think they're all something to be proud of. We'd love to hear your feedback though. What do you think of Claire's painting? How many lore inconsistencies did I have in my glorified fanfiction? Are you happy with our overall redesign or would you have done things differently? Or are you content with the way Brand looks in the game right now? Be sure to share all of your thoughts down in the comments. Thanks for watching everyone. Another huge thank you to all of our Patreon supporters. You guys are truly hot stuff. Enjoy the rest of your day, everyone. We'll see you all in the next video.